thinking about the new year. It's just right around the corner. It's that time where we start to think about New Year's resolutions, and we start to figure out, okay, what are, we, what are the goals that we're going to set for 2019? I think it's a great time for us to look at a person in the Bible, and we can learn from him, and that is Paul. I want to look at the life of Paul today. We're going to be digging into um, Philippians chapter 3, so if you have your Bibles, open them up to Philippians chapter 3. Um, if not, that's okay. You can follow along with me. We're going to be looking at Paul. Paul has this, this famous attitude or this famous approach to life, a worldview, you might say, um, a goal that he has developed as his life's goal, his life resolution, if you will, and he pursues it passionately. And um, he describes what that is in Philippians chapter 3, so we're going to dig into a minute. But, but my thinking is, is if we have the same attitude as Paul, if we have the same goal and approach as him, um, we will learn to live a life similar to Paul's, one of maturity and one where we will grow closer uh, to Christ. So let's dig into Philippians chapter 3 today. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 is where we're going to start off, and it says, this is Paul talking about becoming a stronger, deeper Christian. He says, not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, I think that's very important, straining forward to what lies ahead. Here's the apex of the verse passages right here. It says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's kind of a confusing sentence. We'll explain that in a minute. And it says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So Paul is saying, here's my life goal. My life goal is that I want to pursue the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is he saying there? Paul is saying, my life goal is I want to become more like Jesus. My life goal is I want to become more Christ-like. And in doing so, I will get Jesus. And in doing so, I will get a relationship with Jesus. And so he says, in fact, uh, this is the way that all mature people are to think. He says, if you are mature, you're already thinking like this. If you are mature, this is your approach already. And if you are not mature, he says, and if any of you think otherwise, God's going to reveal that to you. He's going to show you your goals are wrong. This is the goal. And so today we're going to be looking at this needs to be our goal. It says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me. So he's now saying, He's repeating himself. He says, do what I'm doing, imitate me in this, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In us meaning in us that are doing this. And so he's repeating himself again and again and again, saying our goal, our life's ambition needs to be having an attitude where we are pursuing Jesus Christ above everything else. That needs to be our life goal. I love and I find it fascinating that this consumed Paul. I love that this was like his entire life because Paul is very well known for being a man that like once he sets his eyes to something, that's the thing. And so he has all these other things in his life famously that he went and set his eyes for, but when he found Jesus and he set his eyes to Jesus, that became his pursuit. And so because of that, Christ was able to do a mighty and powerful work through Paul who pursued him well. I have a question for you. When was the last time you set spiritual goals for yourself? When was the last time you said, this is my goal? This is my spiritual goal. I think it's so easy for us to, to set resolutions and New Year's resolutions for, for 2019, and a lot of those are probably going to be like physical resolutions, like for our physical health. Like, man, I really got to cut chocolate. I ain't going to eat any chocolate till Easter when the Easter bunny comes. And some of us are going to be like, you know what, I'm going to cut soda. Or, man, I am going to go join a gym and I'm going to lose some weight. Like, that's the most popular resolution. Let's go lose some weight. And we all get a new gym membership. And the gyms love this time of year because everyone shows up in January. And then everyone's gone in February. And we're still paying the bill. And then we forget, that we forget to cancel that membership till about June, right? And so they get a good six months of, of free money there. And so that's kind of how it works. But when was the last time that we took stock of our relationship with God? 
And we said, you know what? Like, this is the areas where I need to get stronger. This is what I need to focus on. This is how I need to grow deeper in my walk with the Lord. I think uh, it's so important for us to have a spiritual goal, especially as we're going into the new year, but not just for the year, but for our life as well. Pastor Mark is going to be teaching all next month on the principles to a healthy Christian life. He's going to be talking about lots of principles. In fact, we're calling this like um, uh, from here to there. It's, it's how to live a better story. So he's going to be walking through all of these different principles that you can find in the Bible. But today, what I want to talk about is, is basically I want this message to serve as a primer, to kind of prepare our hearts, to prepare our minds to receive that message, to receive that series, to receive those principles so we can apply them to our lives, have the right attitude, the right goal as a church, and we can pursue it well so that we can pursue what Christ would have us pursue, and that is him. And Paul is teaching Guys, you got to pursue Jesus. And he says, imitate me in this. Imitate my life goal to become like Jesus in all things. Because Paul understood something. Paul understood that when you live a life pursuing Christ, not only will your life be better, but the lives of the people around you will become better because they will get to experience the love and light of Jesus in you. But also, your relationship with Jesus will become more intimate. You'll have deeper intimacy with our Lord and Savior, which is awesome. And you'll also have a stronger fellowship with him. You'll have a stronger understanding of his heart and his mind, and and you'll have his eyes for people and for himself, and you will start to see the world from his vantage point, and that will change you in a mighty and powerful way. Peter O'Brien, who is a very famous theologian of the 20th century, lived in Australia, he said th- it like this when Paul's, um, when speaking of the prize that Paul is chasing, he said, the, Paul, the prize of Paul is the full and complete gaining of Christ. He's saying that Paul wanted the full and complete gaining of Christ. That was what Paul's ambition was. He says, for whose sake everything else has been counted lost. So everything else doesn't matter because it's all about getting Jesus. He goes on to say that the greatest reward for Paul was to know Jesus fully And so to be in perfect fellowship with Jesus was his life's ambition. Was to be in perfect fellowship with Jesus was his life's ambition. That should be our heart's desire today. Like how often do we desire to be in perfect fellowship with Jesus? But that should be our life's desire. That should be our goal if we want to become a mature Christian. I think so many of us have very practical desires. Like we're like, you know what, like, I can't think about such a lofty idea like right now I need help with my marriage. You know, like right now I need need some peace in my life because I'm afraid I'm about to lose my job. I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent. And and we let some of the, the real, very real circumstances around our lives dictate all of our energy and all of our focus. And so we let all these other things distract, distract us, excuse me, from the real goal. But our heart's desire needs to be that we are in perfect fellowship with Jesus. And here's why. Because yes, you know, we're going to have times when our marriage is going to be, you know, having strain and it's going to be having a lot of problems. But if we have more Jesus in our lives, we're going to be able to love our spouse like Jesus and that will restore our marriage. And if we have more Jesus in our lives, like when we're going through a hard season where it feels like it's a storm, we're going to have the peace of Jesus in our lives so we can weather the storm and we can worship God and thank him that he saw us through that hard season. When you have more Jesus in your life, you're going to have more hope. You're going to have the hope of Jesus in your life. You're going to have stronger faith in Jesus because you're going to know he is faithful and he is one to fulfill all promises. When you have more Jesus in our lives, you're going to have more love in your life. You're going to have a little bit more light in your life. We all need more Jesus. So that is why that should be our heart's desire for 2019 and for the rest of our life because Jesus, he's the prize but he's also the purpose of the Christian life. He's the prize and he's the purpose of the Christian life. So today, that's what I wanna help you guys with. I wanna help you develop this attitude that Paul had, um, that Paul had here in this text and in his life of trying to pursue Jesus. I wanna help you set a goal for 
2019, but I also want to help you just develop this attitude in your life where you become more and more like Jesus, where you want to desire him more than anything. If Jesus was a fountain and you were going to drink the water from the well, that you would always have an inquenchable thirst, that you can never get satisfied, constantly drinking more and more from that well because you want more and more and more of Jesus. That is what I want to help you develop today, and there's three ways that we can do that, three things that we need to do. But before I get into that, I want you guys to hear me well. I wanna tell you what I am not saying. What I am not saying is that you need to just go read your Bible every day for two hours, and then go pray for one hour for, for 12 months, for the 2019, and then you're gonna be a mature Christian. That's, I'm not saying that. Because what that is, is that's a formula. And a formula is dangerous because if you say, hey, if I just read my Bible for two hours and if I just pray to God for one hour, then I am going to be like Jesus. And although those are great things and every Christian should read their Bible and every Christian should pray, I can't give you a formula to say this is how you achieve Christ-likeness because you cannot achieve Christ-likeness through works. You can't. You can't achieve it. And if anyone says that, here, this is how you achieve becoming like Christ, that's not how you do it. How you do it is through the principle and an attitude. You have to shift from trying to do stuff for God to instead just pursuing God in all things. And so when you shift from trying to achieve for God to instead trying to just live for God, you will see radical change through the grace of God. Okay, and so that is what I wanna tell you because I think each one of us, we have our own personal struggles. We have our own story, we have our own problems. And so it would be unfair for me to say, this is how you solve your problems. Instead, you have to have an attitude where you say, you know what, I am going to surrender my problems over to God. I am going to submit to the Spirit, and I am going to allow him to show me how I need to become more Christ-like in this area. And then let God and his Spirit work in your life and show you what it is that you need to work on. And so for some of you, that might be reading your Bible more, and that might be praying. But for others, it might be you know, going out and sharing your faith. And for others, it might just be in a, a community of better Christian friends and having a better support system in your life. And so there's different things and different practices that we need in our lives to grow us to become more Christ-like. For, for every person, it's a little different. So instead of giving me a formula today, I am not gonna give you a formula, but I'm gonna give you principles that you can apply to a lifestyle change to become more like Christ. So the first thing we need to do is we need to be self-aware. We need to be self-aware. And, <clears throat> Talking about this attitude, I think um, before I, I dig into self-aware, I, I do want to maybe clarify, I can see. Um, Matt Chandler, a, a famous pastor from um, a church down in Texas, he, he calls this attitude of Paul's, he calls it spiritual discontentment. Spiritual discontentment. He says that we are not to be okay with our current spiritual standing, that we should not settle for status quo, but we should instead pursue the upward prize that God has for us in Christ. Right? So, we need to be self-aware. That is how we can nurture this attitude of spiritual discontentment, being self-aware. And being self-aware specifically about our spiritual health. Our spiritual health. And what I mean basically is, don't lie to yourself about you. Don't lie to yourself about you. I think a lot of us need to hear that today because we try to gloss over our sins. We try to gloss over our weaknesses. We want to like put up a strong front. No, if you want to become a strong, mature Christian with deeper, deeper intimacy with God, you got to be honest about how dark your thoughts really are. You got to be honest about how real the sin is in your life. You got to be honest about those dark thoughts you've had and that dark places in your heart and you know, all the things that you do. And you got to start to admit that to God. And whatever it is that you're holding on to, maybe it's, you know, you don't want to give God your finances or you don't want to give him a relationship or an addiction, you got to learn to realize that that's a weakness and that's holding you back from having a stronger relationship with Jesus and you got to surrender that to God. And so in order to do that, you have to be self-aware. Um, that's why it's so important for us to know our weaknesses, to not lie to ourselves and to have a time of meditation with God built into the rhythm of our life. It's so important for us to have this time of, of meditation. There has to be a time built into your life for you to be aware of what is really going on in your mind. 
for you to become aware of what is really going on in your heart, for the Spirit to really speak to you and show you these are the areas that you're weak. Because we don't want to stop and look at ourselves. Because we don't want to admit to ourselves how weak we really are. We don't want to admit to ourselves how much we need Jesus. But when you admit how much you need the cross and how much you need grace, that should actually excite you that God has given his grace to you freely and that you have an everlasting amount, an abundance of grace for you to become more like Christ. And so that should actually serve as a catalyst, as the motivation to pursue God more because God will start to work on those weaknesses and he will start to take away those weaknesses by his grace, by the power of his spirit, and he will start to help you become more and more like Jesus. So admitting your weaknesses is like, hey, look how weak I am, actually gives you strength in Christ, which is what Paul talks about in the next chapter. It's why he brings it up. And he says, that's why I can do all things in Christ because he's saying, even in my weaknesses, Christ can make me strong. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Another um, passage in the Bible that talks about this same idea of pursuing God's grace with passion is Hebrews 12. The author of Hebrews 12 is in agreement with Paul here, and it says, talking about Christians who have come before, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so these are Christians and the um, heroes of the faith, we call them, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus. So you see here it's the same goal. It's looking to Jesus. The, the race that we are enduring is to become like Jesus, to obtain Jesus. He is what our eyes are set on. It's Jesus. And he's saying, well, how do you do it? Well, the Hebrews author says very cl clearly here. He says, let, it, let us lay aside every weight. A weight doesn't have to be a sin because, look, it says, and sin which clings so closely. So weights are not sins. Weights are weaknesses. Weights are weaknesses. So what are the weaknesses in your life? I'll give you an example. In my life, a weakness that I can admit openly, excuse me, is I'm strong in my prayer life. Or excuse me, I'm strong in my, in my Bible study. I'm very strong in my Bible study, but I'm weak in my prayer life. Like, I love to get to know about God. I love to get to read the Bible, and, and I can Bible study all day. It gives me energy. It gives me passion. It fuels my love for Jesus. I love to get to know about how great my God is in the Bible. It just it excites me. And that's not how everyone's wired, but that's how I'm wired, right? But I am not the strongest prayer warrior. I'm not. I'm not a prayer warrior. In and, and my prayer life, I want to have a better prayer life. I want to be able to sit down and pray to God, but I find myself, you know, it, it drains me at times. And it, it doesn't give me that energy. It doesn't give me that fuel. I'm not wired like that. And so for me, what I need to do in that situation is, is I need to find people who are prayer warriors. I've put people around my life who I know are prayer warriors, and I, and I pray with them. And I'm around them and, and because I want to not just get to know God and get to know about God, but I want to get to know him personally in my prayer life. And I want to commune with God in prayer so a way for me to get stronger, it's not a sin that I, I, I can't, you know, have to drop, but I have to get stronger in my prayer. And so I'm around people who, who are stronger prayer warriors than me, and, and they, they in their community, they stretch me, they grow me, and hopefully I stretch them to, to read their Bible more and for them to grow more in that. And so that is what this is talking about here. So what is that for you? What's that weight that's holding you back? That's not necessarily a sin, it's just weaknesses in our life. That could be anything. That could honestly be anything. What is it that's holding you back from a deeper, perfect fellowship with God? There's also sin. You know, the sin here, that which clings so closely, that idea is that the sin is actually pushing against you as you are trying to race. It's actually holding you back and pulling on you as you are trying to push forward. That's the idea. So we don't want that in our lives, obviously. So that's the first thing we should abandon, is abandon all sin if we want to become more like Jesus, because that is holding us back from a deeper relationship. So we have to know our weaknesses. We have to be self-aware. We have to put ourselves around people who are stronger than us. You know, back to Philippians 3.17, it says, keep our eyes on those around us who are walking according to the example. So look to people who are more mature than you. Put yourself in a circle of more stronger Christians and have them influence you so that you can become a stronger Christian. Get yourself around people who are the spiritual giants in your church and in your community, okay? So the second thing we have to do, the second thing we have to do is we have to aim at the right target. We have to aim at the right target. Let's get into Philippians 3, 4 through 8, which is a few verses before our main text. 
And it says here, this is Paul speaking, he says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. It almost sounds like he's boasting. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or trash in order that I may gain Christ. That's a powerful passage. This is what Paul is speaking to. I don't know about you, but in, in, in the church of Philippians, they did this thing where they fell into a, a trap. They were a good, healthy church. They didn't have a lot of problems, but they did have this one trap that they fell into. And as a Christian people, what they would do is they would start comparing themselves to other believers in their church. And they would start comparing themselves and say, well, I'm not so bad because look at this, look at this. I've done this and look how bad their life is. And they, and they would compare themselves. So Paul speaks right directly to that. He says, hey guys, I, have, I can compare myself to all of you and I win. I don't care how you want to say it. If you want to compare any works of the flesh, I win. I can beat you all. But guess what? That's not the goal. That's not the target we're aiming for. That's the wrong target. You guys should not be doing that. You should instead be looking to Jesus. And, this is, and I love that Paul does this because um, we do that today. We live in a culture where we compare, man, and it, we can't even help it. It's like um, all the media and the news, they're constantly comparing. You know, they compare, hey, this is how you should look. This is how you should act. This is how you should dress. And they compare, 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 and they tell us how we should live and all these things. And so we, we bring that, that mindset into the spiritual life, and we even as Christians, we, you should catch yourself doing this because you probably do it way more than you think you do. You'll look at a person in the church, a brother or sister, and you'll say, I must be doing pretty good because I don't struggle with that. And when someone opens up in a prayer circle about their sin, you're like, whew, I'm glad I don't have that problem. And, and we compare ourselves and we think that we are doing pretty good because we're not struggling as bad as they are, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we all do this. Well, Paul says, stop it. He says, don't do that because you shouldn't be comparing yourself to John Smith because the goal of the Christian is not to become like John Smith. You shouldn't be comparing yourself to Susie Joe because the goal of the Christian life is not to become like Susie Joe. The goal of the Christian life is to become like Jesus, to become Christ-like. That is our goal. That is our pursuit. That is our prize. So we should compare ourselves to Jesus. And when you compare yourself to Jesus, the holiness of God, the perfect person who lived a perfect life, who is immeasurably holy, you will never measure up. You will always fall short. Always. You should always fall short. And I think we, we know this, and that's why we don't compare ourselves to Jesus, because we don't want to feel defeated. We don't want to feel, you know, humbled, because it will humble us when we compare ourselves to Jesus. Like, man, I, got, I am not as good as I thought I was, and then we have, we're tempted to feel defeated. We're tempted to feel discouragement. But let me encourage you guys today, that is not the attitude we should have when we compare ourselves to Jesus. Because, yes, it can be easy to be tempted to say, you know what, like I'm never going to be perfect, and why should I even start? Why should I even get off the couch and pursue Christ? Well, the reason is simple, because in Christ you can look back and you can say, man, Jesus, he loved me before I became a Christian when I was at my worst. He loved me when I was a filthy sinner and I had no reason, no value, to, nothing to offer him at all. And God still loved me. God in his grace still died on the cross for me. God in his grace still found me and said, you know what, like, you're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. Not because we earned it, not because we achieved or we did anything or we had anything to offer at all, because we didn't. But God put value in us when he died on the cross for us, and he redeemed us and restored us by his grace, by the power of his spirit. And that is so, so important because we can now look back and say, man, look where I was. 
Look what the God has done in me. Look how much he's changed me and grown me. And so when we see all the weaknesses in our lives and we compare ourselves to Jesus and we say, man, I have so much more work to do, that should actually encourage us to, to, chase, to chase Jesus more. Because Jesus is saying, look, I have, yeah, you have so much work to do, but I have the power to do that work in you. I have the power to change you, to be, make you more like Jesus. I have the power to help you. By my grace, you are healed. And so we shouldn't feel any fear and we shouldn't feel any shame in where we were because the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for us. We shouldn't feel any guilt for all of our sin and all of our mistakes every time we fall down and he has to pick us back up on this pursuit. But instead, we should look at that as an opportunity to learn and to chase Jesus more with more passion and more zeal like Paul. That should be our attitude. Not discouragement, but encouragement to chase Jesus more because he has more to offer us. He has more to the abundant life. We will never stop growing closer to Jesus and that should excite us. Our God is infinite, and so there's always more of him to be had. There's always more of his grace to be had. There's always more of his love to be had, more of his passion, more of his peace in our lives. There's always more, and that's a good thing. That should encourage us. So if we're going to exceed, we have to build that practice of chasing Jesus into our lives by comparing ourselves to the right target, to Jesus, okay? That's the second thing. The third principle we need to apply if we are going to have a successful attitude of spiritual discontentment where we chase after God and become more like him is we have to hold true to the promises of the Bible. We have to hold true to the promises of the Bible. Philippians 1, 6 is one of these scriptures that where God is promising. He says, um, God promises in the Bible in many places that he is at work in our lives that he wants us to become Christ-like, and so he is going to help us do it. We don't have to do it alone. By the power of his spirit, he is going to help us. Philippians 1, 6 says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is going to do a work in you, and one day it will be finished. One day he will complete that work. So know that there is a target, and that we will see that day come. And that day might not be today, and it might not be tomorrow, but God is doing a work in us. The, the next one is Galatians 6, 9, and it says, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I love that the Bible compares our race, or excuse me, our walk with God as a race, as an endurance, as a marathon, and he's saying you have to endure, you can't give up, keep going, keep striving, keep chasing after me. It's worth it. There is a prize at the end, and I am worth it, okay? And then he says, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and we all, I love this passage, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, having seen Jesus, okay, having seen God in our lives, having seen God around us, it says, we are being transformed into that same image, to the image of Jesus, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is a powerful passage if we can grasp it. God is saying that by my power in the Spirit, by my Holy Spirit, which now resides in you, I am changing you degree by degree. I am working in your life degree by degree. Step by step, I am making you more like me. I am giving you my reflected glory, and I am letting you become more and more like me, and I'm helping you do it by my power. I think that we have to hold on to these promises. There's a lot more in the Bible. They're all throughout the Bible, and we have to hold on to these as we try to chase after Jesus. These are encouragements for when the times that we feel like we're gonna have to give up, for the times when you feel like it's too much, like, you know, everything is, is, is coming in, like, I don't know if I can do it anymore. Um, we have to continue to push on because the spiritual journey can be exhausted and we can feel tempted to defeat, tempted to give up because that's what Satan wants to do.
everyone, my name's Chris. I serve on the worship team and we are so glad that you watched today. Hey, if you've ever considered visiting us, we would love to have you here. There's so much more that goes on behind the scenes that you just don't get to experience by watching us on TV, even though we're glad that you do watch us. We invite you to come out at any service. We have three services every weekend and we hope to see you here.